What did the only surviving member of the Dyatlov expedition say when they asked if he wanted to finish the hike? I'll pass. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the War Lodge. The Dyatlov Pass incident is probably one of the best-known true horror stories out there. The part everybody knows, nine hikers go into the Russian wilderness and none of them come out, is basically the story, but it goes so much deep, so, so much deeper than I thought it was going to go. The way I've always heard this, the way I was introduced to the Dyatlov Pass narrative was basically the almost creepypasta version that very much implies it was a Yeti or something, but I'm sure you've heard that version. Dyatlov and his group go up into the mountains. At some point in the night, something happens that causes them to all flee from the tent. They're found in various areas, various stages of undress. Certain people are missing weird soft tissue. There's people with broken ribs that have the, imp like, it must have been a car's impact, that kind of thing. So you hear all of those stories, and it leads you to think, all right, well, there's, there's no possible single simple explanation for this. And that would be the case. Over the years, numerous theories have been put forward, ranging from a natural disaster to a conspiracy, all the way through to something paranormal. The official narrative from the Russian government, as well as the prevailing mainstream theory regarding this case, is that this was an avalanche. These people would have been forced out of their tent by an oncoming avalanche, not had time to prepare properly, gone out into the Siberian wilderness, and just not made it, because how are you going to survive like that? But there's other things involved that caused people to question that possibility. For example, somebody reported much later on that they had seen bright orange lights in the sky, and that, of course, drove conspiracy theories about UFOs. There's also the fact that we're talking about the Ural Mountains in the Soviet Union in 1959, and the fact that there could have been weapons testing going on. These people were just in the wrong area at the wrong time, and the reason there's been so much murkiness regarding the case is that the Russian government didn't want to confess to accidentally killing several of their own people. And then, of course, there's Bigfoot, because there's, al there's always Bigfoot. Those latter options seem less likely than an avalanche, but there are circumstances regarding the avalanche that make me wonder if, if that really could account for all of it. There's also two other Russian hiking expedition disasters that come to mind when looking at the Dyatlov Pass incident that are often brought up in tandem with it. Ten hikers died at a pass that I don't care to try and pronounce, but you know what, I got it because it's YouTube. It's something along the lines of Chivrue. Anyway, that was in 1973 and ten people died. 20 years after that, hikers in the Kamar Daban range also inexplicably dropped dead. They left only one absolutely terrified survivor who managed to make her way back and explain to everybody what she experienced. On its face, it kind of does seem like there is something killing Russians on mountains. And this time, it's not the Mujahideen. So what did happen at Dyatlov Pass? Was it something that's connected to other similar events happening elsewhere in Russia? Was this a paranormal event? Are we talking about UFOs? Or was this simply an unfortunate, tragic, natural disaster? In order to get to the bottom of that, I had to dig into a lot... Guys, so many files. So many files. Like, just so many documents. On the one hand, this is, it was a treasure trove of documents. It was nice to have every question I could possibly have within answerable distance, but good lord, hundreds of pages of Russian documents that I had to read, basically a Google translated version of. So this was a lot of fun. And be because of that, this is gonna be a two-part video. That's my fun little way of announcing that, yeah, this is part one. So what this video is gonna do is cover everything that you need to know to understand the analysis of the evidence that's gonna come in the next video. Because if you don't understand the entire trip and what was actually going on here, the level of experience everybody had, what their motivations were, things like that, it's kind of hard to understand everything that goes down. So what this video, part one, is going to do is tell you everything that you need to know about the lead up to that night, as well as the official response to what happened, so that we can dive into a lot of the more nitty gritty details of everything that went on, and why some theories hold more water than others here, and why the official explanation of avalanche doesn't quite do it for me. So, as always, let's start with the region that we're talking about. Because one suggestion that was brought up was, well, hey, maybe they were attacked by some sort of uncontacted or primitive tribe in the area. Maybe it was a case of wrong place, wrong time, but it was human influence. Well, there is a native group there that was considered to be a possible culprit. You see, Dyatlov Pass hasn't always been called Dyatlov Pass, and it's not even technically the name of the mountain. The mountain itself, and again, I am trying my best to pronounce this, 
is Hulatsuko. And in the language of the indigenous people of this area, the Mansi, that means dead mountain. Now, the Mansi are a Ugric language speaking group of native Siberians who live in the Ural Mountain area. And at the time of Russian expansion into Siberia, the Mansi were a semi nomadic people, so they made their living mostly off of herding, hunting, fishing, trapping, and they had some small scale agriculture. They would settle in permanent villages for the winters and then spend the warmer months following the herds. And you might be thinking, hey, that sounds a lot like when the British and the French went to America. And it does in a lot of ways, except when the Russians went in, they found that the Mansi, prior to encountering the Empire of Russia, already had chainmail, iron weapons, and were using longbows, which I'm hesitant to believe this was an actual U longbow, and I think it was probably a longer bow, and whoever was writing this didn't clarify, but I just want to make it clear, I don't think they were using Welsh-style longbows for any historians in the chat. In regards to culture, the Mansi had a sort of shamanistic animist religion, they had a bear cult which was very popular amongst them, and is not unheard of amongst a lot of the Eastern European groups. Bear cult, bear worship, not something that's unusual. But this involves things like bear hunts and plays, singing, dancing, poetry, and feasting. But I just told you a bunch of stuff about the Mansi after telling you they call this Dead Mountain and already called it Dead Mountain before the Dyatlov group ever got there, so you're probably saying, Aiden, enough with the culture, get to the actual story. I am. The thing about the mountain being called Dead Mountain is that that's not quite a word-for-word -word translation of what the Mansi call it. They call it Silent Peak, and they call it Silent Peak because there's not really any game up there. They could never find a ton of animals, it just wasn't considered good hunting, so they didn't go up there. It started to become called Dead Mountain or Mountain of the Dead, mostly after the Dyatlov expedition. And speaking of the Dyatlov expedition, we should probably talk in detail about who these people were, because they weren't just nine random hikers out for a walk on a Sunday. This wasn't your family saying, hey, let's get up and go hike that nearby small mountain trail. These guys were experienced hikers on their way out into the wilderness, not just to hike, but to also do some work. The group was organized by Ural Polytechnic Institute student Igor Dyatlov, a 23-year-old radio engineering student. It was initially a 10-person expedition, of course Yuri Yudin, the 10th member, was the one who turned back. But according to the official documents, remember this is the Soviet Union, there was a little bit more paperwork going on than here in the United States, but according to official documents, the route plan, the objectives, the goals were as follows. Number one was getting to know the natives and the economy of the Ural Mountains better. Number two was holding lectures and carrying out conversations with the public, which implies that when they got back from the expedition, they were supposed to maybe present papers or something. Number three, which as far as I can tell is actually the primary reason the trip was even going on at all, was to improve the hiking experience of the members because they were all trying to get better certifications. They were all certified for grade two hikes, but not for grade three, even though some members of the team had completed grade three hikes. By the end of it, everybody would be grade 3 certified. Number four was to study the depth of soil freezing according to surveys and the observations of the public. Now, as for the hiking certification issue, that appears to have been, as I said, the primary purpose of this expedition. The other three seem to have been sort of ways of justifying it. Now, we've got to remember that these are Soviet hiking grades, not modern Russian hiking grades, so a grade 3 would not match what would currently be a grade 3. A grade 3 hike back then in Russia would have been 300 kilometers in distance. A third of that had to be on terrain that was difficult. We're talking about rocks, ice, no roads. It also had to be 16 days in length, and at least 8 of those days had to be spent out away from populated areas. The participants were all experienced hikers, and all but one of them were current or former Ural Polytechnic Institute students, but from varying degree fields. All of them, almost all of them, were engineers. Igor Dyatlov was, of course, the expedition leader, and at the age of 20, he had become pretty well-known, at least at Ural Polytechnic, for developing a portable radio for use on hikes. And he had also created a prototype portable camping stove. He was an avid hiker, he was in great physical condition, he was known for his good character, and of course, he was extremely intelligent. There was also Ludmila Dubinina. She was a 20-year-old, I believe she was actually the youngest on the trip. Like the majority of the people on the trip, she was an engineering student, and she was also the group's treasurer. This would be her seventh major hike, her first true grade three hike, and uh, this would not be the first time that she got injured on a hiking expedition, because on a previous expedition, she'd actually been shot in the leg. It was an accident, 
there there was no like weirdness here that one of the people on the trip was a hunter and had a rifle and it negligent discharge things happen her friends described her as being wise thoughtful fair and a good leader she was known for being very attentive to the needs of her companions and she was extremely excited about going on this trip 24 year old alexander kolevatov was a nuclear engineering student and he was getting ready for a pretty prosperous career in the russian nuclear weapons program the Dyatlov expedition would be his 10th major hike, and it would also be his second grade three. Zina Kolmogorova was another radio engineering student like Igor Dyatlov. She was 22 years old, and she was the one in charge of the group diary. She was known for being kind, respectful, and very extroverted, and there's a possibility that there was some romantic connection between her and Dyatlov, but that's uncertain. She was also chair of the qualifying commission for the hiking club at UPI. One of the most experienced members of the expedition, this would be her 15th trip, and it would be her third grade three. 23-year-old Rustem Slobodin was in charge of the equipment for the repair kit. He was a distance runner and a mandolin player, and while he was not the most talkative in the group, he had survived some pretty insane and difficult treks. Nicolas Thibault Brunol was the son of a French communist who was in exile in Russia, and at the age of just 23 had already achieved his PhD. The site I was using is translated from Russian, so I'm not entirely sure, but it said a construction engineering PhD, which doesn't quite sound right, but I assume that's more of a language issue. Thibault was also a member of the qualifying commission. This would be his fifth trek, his second grade three, and he had led hikes in the past, but he had no special assignment on this one. He was just along for the ride. The group topographer, a Yuri Kravanashenko, was a close friend of Dyatlov who had been on a lot of expeditions with him. Aside from being the group's topographer, the 23-year-old was also kind of known for being the camp comic relief. He was a hydraulic student, and after graduation, he went on to work at Chelyabinsk 40, which was, of course, a nuclear site. If you've heard that name before, it's because it was the site of the 1957 Kishtim disaster. Yuri was there when a pretty major plutonium leak occurred, which released more radiation but affected fewer people than Chernobyl. At the time of that disaster, radiation and its effects were not as well understood, and precautions were not taken to the necessary extent. For example, workers at the plant that day did not decontaminate themselves before going home. They wore their normal clothes back home, and as a result, some of them ended up with just radioactive clothing for a long time. In this case, though, unlike Chernobyl, most of the radiation blew away from human habitation and dissipated before it could reach any significant or dangerous levels. So there was no evacuation effort for like a week after that. And this hike would be Yuri's ninth major trek and his first grade three. And then there was the odd man out of the group, Semyon Zolotar. He was the eldest member of the group at 37 or 38 years old, and he was not initially supposed to be going. He had planned to take another hiking trip for similar purposes as the rest of them for his profession. He was a sporting instructor, I believe. And at the last minute, due to connections within the Communist Party, he managed to get himself reassigned to Dyatlov's trip, which was a little bit shorter. Zolotaryov is also an interesting character in the story because while he was initially not part of the plan, and everyone was a little skeptical of the old guy who was involved, he did very quickly and ingratiate himself, though diaries suggest he kept his distance, but involved himself to the extent that it, was, it wasn't it was weird. He was just trying to give people respect and space. But he was also a veteran. He had kind of bounced around the military a little bit, and his record suggests that he was never really the greatest at being in the military, but nonetheless, he was able to pull some favors in the Communist Party to get himself onto this hike so he wouldn't have to go on a longer one. And then, if you look at the official project plan, there's a few names that are on that that don't end up being on the trip. Those are specifically Vishnevsky, Popov, Blenko, Verhatov, and Yudin. Now, Yuri Yudin was the only member of the group to both go on the trip and survive. Interestingly enough, Blenko, who didn't end up going, was supposed to be the group's historian. Yudin survived because just before setting off on the actual hiking portion of the expedition, he had a flare-up in his sciatic nerve, and he had to go back home. It would have been Yuri's seventh hike and his second grade three. So, the ten members of the group as it started received their route book on the 23rd of January, 1959, and on that, their trail was marked as route number five. And I will admit, a lot of this planning stuff is a little bit of unfamiliar territory to me, because it's not clear to me who all of the authorities actually were. They had to file a lot of paperwork, there were certain things they were supposed to file that didn't get filed, they were still allowed to go on the trip. There's some weird stuff about, you know, how many responsibilities everybody has. So maybe it's just that the Soviet Union had a, a different system that I 
did not totally understand, or maybe this is just kind of overcomplicated because communists. The group is approved for a trip in this hay, which would begin on January 28th, and they would reach that via train and then via a truck. They would be hiking all the way out to Mount Otorten and then back. They left Yekaterinburg on the 23rd of January and arrived in Serov the next morning. They left Serov for Ivdel at 6.30 p.m. and then arrived in Ivdel around midnight and then departed again for Vizay about five in the morning. An entry in the group diary kept by Kolmogorova, which of course had multiple authors, it seems that everybody had a different day that they were supposed to record. But that diary says that they left the window in their hotel room open just a little bit and that it got a bit cold. It also notes the temperature outside at negative 17 degrees Celsius. If you use freedom units, that's 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. The coldest weather I can ever remember going out in was negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. It was when I was at Penn State, and it was so cold that every single student signed a change.org petition to cancel classes because it was negative 10 degrees with a negative 25 degree wind chill, and they still tried to have class. Remarking on the lukewarm tea that they are said to have been served at the hotel, Dyatlov apparently said, go drink it outside, it'll feel hot. The group then negotiated a truck ride to District 41, which so far as I can tell was a logging area. And an entry from the same day by Tebow reads, I can't, although I tried, which is how I figured that, you know what, it seems like every member was supposed to try and put something in the diary, not just that they could. Also, the planned route had them skiing from Vizhay to District 41 on the first and second days. I'm not sure if they were allowed to take a truck, but I assume that if it was in the diary, they were allowed to take a truck. They then left from District 41 to head to Second Northern Village on the 27th, and Doroshenko remarked in the group diary that the weather was great. The group made a deal to borrow a horse on the way to Second Northern, and the diary also notes that they heard some illegal counter-revolutionary songs. They left for Second Northern at 4 p.m. on the 27th, and the diary notes that the horse made it slow going because the horse was just kind of slow, but it also says, what a pleasure to go without backpacks. So it means that they were basically sacrificing speed for comfort. Unfortunately, that meant that in two hours, by 6 p.m., they had only gone eight kilometers. That's just five miles, and the total hike from District 41 to Second Northern was a full 24 kilometers, or 15 miles. They eventually made it to Second Northern very late in the evening, after dark, and also there was the problem of Yuri realized that he, he was not going to be able to keep going, and Yuri Yudin, because there's like four Yuris on this trip. The diary notes that they stayed up the majority of the night until about 3 a.m., and that everybody was in good spirits, but they were disappointed that they would be losing Yuri. The site they were staying at, Second Northern Village, was an abandoned work camp, and it was also a rather significant geological site at some point, enough that Yuri Yudin decided that he was going to take a few people, and since he was a geologist, go and see if they could find any interesting gemstones or anything that would be worth bringing back to the university. As for lodging, there were 20 to 25 houses there, but only one of them was actually livable, and several people managed to hurt themselves on nails and boards and such. It is rather impressive that they managed to find this entire thing in what was essentially pure darkness with only the stars and moon to guide themselves. The morning of the 28th began with everybody else waking up to the rumbling of the voices of Kravanashenko and Kalevatov, which I can't tell what exactly that's supposed to mean. There's some suggestions in the diary that maybe Kalevatov and uh, Kravanashenko were not getting along super well, but it's also hard to say, and I don't want to make any assumptions, because there really is nothing concrete in the diaries. This was the point at which Yuri Yudin decided to take a few people and go look for gemstones, but all they were able to find was quartz and pyrite, so there was really nothing worth taking. They left the camp at 11.45 a.m., Yuri Yudin headed back for District 41, and the rest of the group headed on to Mount Otorten. They were headed up the Lozva River, and the way that this was working was the group would head up the river, and Kravanashenko would kind of trail behind to make topographical notes. They stopped at about 5.30 p.m. to set up camp along the side of the river, and they also took some time to sew curtains for the tent out of sheets, which, to my understanding, was a way of kind of keeping a bit more air sealed in so that it was warmer. They also had some dinner, Slobodin played the mandolin, and they talked about love. According to the diary, the portable stove that they had brought along hung in a way that it kind of divided the tent into two sections. And while this entry is unsigned, its author writes that whoever the author is, as well as Kolmogorova, sleep on the further section of the tent. Apparently nobody wanted to sleep by the stove, where it was 
too hot or maybe they were worried about burning themselves or something like that and they elected that Kravonashenko was gonna sleep there but he was not super happy about that and he at some point started like got up started cursing at everybody and the diary even says or at least the translation says that he accused some people of treason. The only other person who is named in this diary entry is Kalevatov who apparently was sleeping by the entrance to the tent. I do think that there are some translation issues between Russian and English here because just some stuff doesn't make sense here. It's a 12 person tent, there's nine people in it. Why are only four of them named? Why only these ones? What was the, the relevance here? What was going on? As for the 29th of January, not much is written and that's probably because it was Tebow's day and he was the guy who wrote earlier, I can't, although I tried. There is, however, a PS written there that says witless writing in two days. Uh, the person writing in two days would be Dyatlov, so that was either a joke or Tebow was frustrated with Dyatlov. All we get for that day is that they took a Monsi Deer Trail to find the Aspia River and that it was negative 13 degrees Celsius. The entry for the 30th is unsigned and split into two, one of them appearing to have been written on the go and the other one appears to have been when they got back to camp. It's noted that the curtains are quote unquote quite justified, so that is why I assume that they had something to do with heat. It's also noted that the stove was working well, but both Tebow and Kravonashenko thought that there were ways they could probably improve it, possibly with steam heat, something like that, so that their nights were a little bit warmer. They had gotten up at 8.30 a.m. that morning, eaten breakfast, took down camp, and started hiking up the Monsi trails. The writer mentions that the Monsi are an interesting northern people who have both their own written language as well as a standardized series of glyphs to tell you different things as you were out in the forest. If you've ever played the Thieves Guild quest line of Skyrim, you're probably familiar with this concept. It also refers to the numbers of the Monsi and says that it's a small nation of about 8,000 people. The second entry basically only talks about the weather. It is cold. The snow is said to be about four feet deep outside of the trail, and it notes that they were having some trouble because they would follow well-beaten trails that turned into trodden paths that just abruptly ended because these were hunting trails for the most part where somebody had been following deer. The writer says that you can feel the altitude, but also that everything is as usual and there's, there's no reason to be concerned, basically. And then we have Dyatlov writing the entry for January 31st, 1959, the night before the incident. They started up a Monsi trail at 10 a.m. and eventually actually came across a Monsi hunter. The weather was very bad, they could not see very far ahead of them, and he mentioned how they basically would have one person go a little bit ahead, five minutes, then come back, that person would rest, the rest of the group would push forward, the person at the head then would go ahead five minutes, come back, rest, push forward, so that they could all form a trail and it wasn't all of them constantly trying to trailblaze at the same time. It was very slow going and they only progressed at a rate of about one mile an hour in negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very below freezing. For those of you using the metric system, that's about negative 23 degrees Celsius. They made their way out of the Auspia Valley up towards the mountain pass they needed to take to get back into the Lozva Valley with Dyatlov riding as they went. He mentions that the trees were thinning, the firs being replaced by birch forest. And I had to look for a bit better of a translation on this specific point, but Dyatlov does remark on how hostile the terrain is. It got very icy after they left the tree line, and he mentions that the making of a storage depot, which was something that they actually had to do on the trip, was not going to be possible up there. They began looking for a place to set up camp around 4 p.m., and they realized setting up camp up on top of the mountain was not going to work. They could not do this this far above the tree line, so they headed back down a ways into the valley a little bit more and set up camp down there. It's also said the only wood they could get was wet, weak fur, but that it was warm enough inside of the tent. The very last line of the final entry in the group diary is Dyatlov saying, It is difficult to imagine such comfort somewhere in a mountain range, wind howling outside hundreds of kilometers from any inhabited places. At this point in the journey, it seems that they were actually already behind by almost a day, and if they did not get moving soon, they would be closing in on two. By the 31st, they should have already entered the Lozva Valley. They should not be camping in the Aspia Valley. By the end of the day on the 1st of February, they absolutely should not have been in the Aspia Valley, but they found themselves being forced to camp in the open in a pass on the 1st. Part of the reason they had to camp out in the open is that they still needed to create that storage depot in the Alspia, and they had to spend an inordinate amount of time on the first searching for it. So when they should have been traveling several miles that day, they really only traveled a couple kilometers. 
Around 3 p.m. on the 1st, they finally were able to establish their camp, and that was how late in the day they ended up trying to hike out of the Alspia Valley. By 6 p.m., they'd only made it about a kilometer up the mountain, and it was getting dark, they needed to set up camp, and they were forced to set up camp on the slope at 900 meters in elevation. What happened after that is very hotly debated, but here's what we know. The group should have returned to Vizay by February 12th at the latest, at which point he was to telegram UPI to inform them that the group had made it back. However, he had told Yuri Yudin that he expected the trip was going to take a little bit longer than had been planned, so nobody was super worried for the first couple days that nobody said anything. But by the 20th, over a week since they were supposed to be back, people started clamoring for answers, specifically family members of the hikers. The first to become uneasy was Alex Kolotov's sister, Rima Kolevatova. And there was enough uproar that a group of students and teachers actually volunteered to go looking, others from UPI, and they set off on the 21st. Then on the 26th, it's confirmed that Nikita Khrushchev actually received a telegram about this. It was shown to him on the 27th, and then on the 28th, there was actually an official decision to send out a rescue party. In what is essentially a joke about the inefficiency of government, by the 28th, when the government did decide to send out a search party, the student volunteers had already found the tent, two days earlier. It was on peak 1079, in an area where the slope of the mountain was 18 to 20 degrees. The tent entrance itself was facing the pass. Part of the issue, though, here is that the exact location of the tent is in dispute, so in considering environmental environmental factors, especially something as localized as an avalanche, you have to make sure that you're looking at the right spot on the mountain. Officials place it at 61 degrees, 75 minutes, and 95 seconds north, 59 degrees, 42 minutes, 96 seconds east, whereas independent researchers place the tent at 61 degrees, 45 minutes, 30 seconds north, and 59 degrees, 25 minutes, 46 seconds east, which is about 116 meters southwest. The snow beneath the tent had been flattened, the skis were stacked outside, it was almost completely covered in snow, and it was torn in two places. The side facing the hill had a small tear in it that seemed to be plugged by a fur jacket, and the side facing the slope was torn open from the inside as if with a knife. Documentation suggests that the sleeping order that night, and possibly most nights, was as follows. It would have begun Dyatlov at the back, then Slobodin and Kolevatov, in that order, and then, in an unknown order, Doroshenko, Kolmogorova, and Krivonoshenko, and then, in the following order again, Thibaut, Dubinina, and Zolotaryov. Additionally, the tent contained a number of items. At the entrance were the stove, an axe, a saw, a couple of buckets, and in one of those buckets, a jar of medical alcohol. Further back were the cameras, and at the very end, by Dyatlov, were an unsigned diary, maps, documents, Dyatlov's camera, a tin box of money, a bag of crackers, and a bag of barley. I do not know why they had barley. I really can't think of why they would have had barley. Against the wall, we're just told that other products were present, as well as two pairs of shoes, and the other six pairs were on the opposite side, with three and a half pairs of felt boots somewhere scattered in the middle. As far as the shoes issue goes, everybody on the trip had multiple pairs of shoes. Their backpacks were spread across the bottom of the tent with quilted jackets on top of those and quilted blankets on top of the quilted jackets with additional blankets set aside. Most of the warm clothes they had were also sitting atop the blankets. The next day, the 27th, bodies began to appear. Kravonashenko and Doroshenko were the first to be found and they were under a cedar tree about 1.5 kilometers from the tent. They had gone northeast and they had managed to set up a fire under the cedar tree. The fire was actually the first thing spotted by the volunteers, because it was a clearly man-made object, even though it was out. Kravonashenko and Doroshenko were found a couple of meters away from it, one on his stomach, the other on his back, right next to each other. And this was spotted by Yuri Koplatov and Mikhail Sherevin. Additionally, beneath the bodies were a number of broken branches. Doroshenko lay on his stomach, he was wearing a checkered short sleeve shirt, a sleeveless cotton undershirt, shorts, swim trunks, badly ripped cotton underwear, and a different set of socks on each foot with no shoes. The socks on his left foot had been burned, and it appeared that his body had been moved after death. His hand also sported a minor burn. Kravonashenko was found on his back, and he wore a long sleeve checkered shirt, cotton undershirt, swim trunks, long underpants, and a single sock on his left foot. Dyatlov and Kolmgorova were the next to be found. Kolmgorova, about 850 meters away from the cedar tree. She was buried under 10 to 50 centimeters of snow, I've seen both numbers, laying on her right side in a position that indicated that she was struggling to maintain her movement. She was wearing 
wearing two hats, a long-sleeved undershirt, sweater, checkered shirt, and a second sweater with a torn cuff on the right sleeve. She also wore cotton sport pants, trousers, ski pants, and three pairs of socks, two of which were thin, the third wool with insoles, and she was not wearing real boots. Dyatlov was found between the cedar tree and Kolmgorova by a Monsi tracking group. He was laying on the ground on his back, his head towards the tent, with his arms across his chest as if he was like doing a Superman ripping off the shirt kind of motion. And I'm not saying that to make a joke. If you look at the picture, that's literally what it looks like. Obviously, we cannot show you post-mortem photos on here. One of the odd things about Dyatlov, if you look at the photo, and I'll have a link to all of this information in the description, but if you look at the photo, it looks as if he died in the middle of this motion. It was as if he just flash froze. As for what he himself was wearing, he wore an unbuttoned sleeveless fur vest, sweater, long sleeve cotton shirt, sleeveless cotton singlet, pants, ski pants, and two socks, one cotton and one wool, and his watch was stopped at 531. That was all they found on the 27th, but not much longer on March 5th, they did find the body of Rustim Slobodin. He was 480 meters from the same cedar tree between the locations of Kolmogorova and Dyatlov. He was face down, his arms flung out to the sides, and he was wearing a long sleeve undershirt shirt, shirt, sweater, two pairs of pants, four pairs of socks, and one felt boot on his right foot. His watch stopped at 8.45 a.m. I say a.m. because it's almost positive these guys died in the morning. But surprisingly, the other four members of the group were nowhere to be found, but they also hadn't turned up anywhere saying, hey, hi, I'm alive. And this might be because the search team had underestimated how deep the snow actually was, because it took until May 5th when the snow was finally melting for another Monsi tracker or hunter to actually come across their belongings. The first thing to be spotted was a pair of black sweatpants where part of the right leg had been cut off. They also then found a woman's sweater and not long after that, several corpses. And that Monsi man's name was Kurikov, from what I can tell. After some searching, Dubinina was found on her knees with her face and chest pressed against the rock. She wore a short sleeve shirt, a long sleeve shirt, two sweaters, underwear, long socks, two pairs of pants, two more pairs of short socks, and a hat. Zolotaryov and Kolevatov were found breast to back with Kolevatov's chest to Zolotaryov's back. Zolotaryov wore two hats, a scarf, short sleeve shirt, long sleeve shirt, black sweater, and a coat, and then on the bottom, he had underwear, two pairs of pants, a pair of ski pants, socks, and slippers. Kolevatov, behind him, was wearing a sleeveless shirt, long sleeve shirt, sweater, fleece sweater, ski jacket, unzipped, as well as shorts, ski pants, and canvas pants with wool socks underneath them, and there were actually a couple of pairs of other socks under the wool socks. Kolevatov's socks had signs of fire damage, and very interestingly, there were several seven to eight centimeter long gashes in the jacket's right arm. Finally, Tebow wore a canvas fur hat over a homemade wool hat, a shirt, wool sweater, fur jacket, underwear, sweatpants, cotton pants, ski pants, wool socks, and felt boots. He also had gloves, but was not wearing them. They were in his pocket, as well as two watches stopped at 8.14 and 8.30. With all of the members of the group accounted for, it was time for everybody to try and figure out what actually happened here, which involved two full investigations, one immediately in the aftermath and one much later on. There were simply so many unanswered questions. Had they gone up there and it, everybody was in the same place and they had all frozen to death, that's one thing. Or if the tent had burned down, that's another thing. If somebody had gunshot wounds, then at least you know that somebody else killed these people. But instead, they had nine bodies in various states of physical distress and injury. All of these people were dead, and nobody really knew why. And I think the very first question to address here is the cause of death one. The first four bodies to be found were autopsied by a team, and that team was led by Boris Vazrazdenya. All four of those first bodies to be autopsied were determined to have died of hypothermia, despite the presence of other definitely not hypothermia-consistent injuries. The medical examiners, as a group, weren't really super confident in the hypothermia answer as being the sole cause of death, but they did have to provide a concrete, firm cause of death that could be backed up with evidence, so they said hypothermia. But interestingly, when Slobodin was found just a week later, the only person to autopsy him was Vazrazdinya. Slobodin also had several injuries that were not consistent with hypothermia that must have occurred after they left the tent that night and yet he was also hypothermia. There are some possibilities
possibilities here before we get too conspiratorial. It could be that the first four bodies were autopsied by a team because it was simply too much work for one man to perform quickly. Or it could be that by the time Slobodin rolled in, Vazrazdinje had gone to his superiors and said, hey, I don't think this was hypothermia. Maybe we should keep this on the down low. However, if there were any doubts that something other than hypothermia was killing people here, they were completely confirmed with the bodies of the next four. All four had been found in a den that they constructed. They were all well-dressed and all four had significant physical injuries. This time, when the autopsies rolled around, three out of four did not list hypothermia as the cause of death. Looking at those four, Dubonina was found pressed against a wall with her eyes and tongue missing, nose and ribs broken, and her cause of death was listed as massive internal bleeding due to multiple rib fractures. Tebow was half submerged in meltwater as it streamed down the ravine, with a massive fracture to the temporal bone on the right side of his head and hemorrhaging in the right forearm. The cause of death was listed as bleeding in the brain. Zolotaryov, remember, was found in the arms of Kalevatov. His eyes were missing, he had massively broken ribs, and his cause of death was listed as massive internal bleeding as a result of his chest essentially being crushed. Kalevatov, on the other hand, had no major physical injuries. His neck was deformed, is all the autopsy says, and he had a wound behind his right ear, but the autopsy suggests that the wound behind the right ear was post-mortem and the neck deformation also may have been post-mortem. So Kalevatov was ruled to have died of hypothermia, but why did he die of hypothermia with his arms wrapped around a man who was dying of his chest being crushed? Like I said, questions. And for decades, people have had a lot of questions about Dyatlov Pass. What caused them to leave their tent, and why was it slashed open from the inside? Why did members of the group try to climb that cedar tree, as evidenced by the fact that there are branches broken as high as five meters up, and several people had tears in the skin of their hands? When did the group separate, and why did they leave the cedar? Why did Dyatlov, Kolmogorova, and Slobodin alone try to reach the tent, or did the other rest of the group try to reach the tent with them and turn back? Were Kolmogorova, Slobodin, and Dyatlov all coming back to the tent from the cedar, or were they on their way to the cedar, and why did they choose to go back to the tent from the cedar if they did? Of those who were not found between the tent and the cedar, why did they choose to build a den? And perhaps the most interesting question of all, why did a bunch of them die of hypothermia, and then the ones in the den appear to have died of significant physical trauma? For a long time, the only answer anybody had was the official answer. The cause of their death was overwhelming physical force, which the hikers were unable to overcome. That sheer lack of any legitimate answers backed up by any real evidence led to a flurry of theories regarding everything from natives attacking to military tests to yetis. Aliens, bioweapons, cover-up, you name it, it has been responsible for Dyatlov Pass. In fact, I would bet you that John Mulaney has a story about being blamed for Dyatlov Pass. I was over on the bench. And then finally, in 2020, after a reinvestigation effort that lasted several years, we finally got an official answer that wasn't just, um, overwhelming force? And not to make two Skyrim references, in one video, but this is different from unrelenting force. We're not sitting here saying that somebody was up on that mountain going fusro da at these people. But the man in charge of that investigation, Andrei Kuryakov, who is the deputy head of the prosecutor general's office for the Urals Federal District, made an announcement. It was an avalanche. And that answer satisfied some people as it explained two things, why they left the tent and why the tent was destroyed and covered in snow. The theory was also bolstered by the fact that engineers hearing of this used the snow physics modeling from Disney's Frozen to recreate the conditions that led to this avalanche. But there are some things that it actually doesn't explain. For example, the injuries to Dubinina, Tebow, and Zolotaryov. If they had sustained the injuries they sustained up at the tent, they would not have made it to their den. And therein lies the problem of the mystery of Dyatlov Pass. Every time some question is answered, it seems to create a different one. There is no single explanation that accounts for every factor of this case. So that's precisely what we're gonna do. As I said earlier, we decided to break this video into two parts because it was simply just too much to cover in one week. So I wanted a second week to keep diving into some of these details because there's a lot that I couldn't get to in this video that I came across while I was doing the research. For example, soft tissue damage that shouldn't be there, lack of soft tissue damage when it should be there, baton marks, suggestions that maybe there were different points at which people were dying here. There's a lot that went into this entire episode that just, you, you can't just mention it as you're doing the timeline.
You've got to kind of break things up into those questions I posed and then answer them point by point until you get to a conclusion. I am not confident, because I'm being honest with you right now, I have not started doing the, the notes for, for part two. I am not confident that I'm coming up with an answer, but I'm gonna try. <laughs> um, so if you wanna support us trying to figure out the answer to things, you can subscribe to us on Patreon or here on YouTube for a quick little $1 a month on Patreon or $5 a month here. If you do it over on Patreon, you can also do five, 10, 25, it goes on. Um, you know, we appreciate it either way. You can also catch these discussions, these topics, in a live format Sunday nights at 7 p.m. You can rock our gear from the lorelodge.shop, which is mostly designed by me, and if it's not, it's designed by our, our wonderful graphic artist, Norman Keyes. And if you would like to buy our coffee so that you can stay as awake as we do, you can get it from Tableau Roasting Company. It is called Mount Pocono Perk. I designed it myself. I was a barista for six years. I know, I know, I'm cool. But anyway, uh, I had something else to say and I can't totally remember what it is right now. So Aiden. Weird Bible? Oh, you want me to just go? Yeah. Okay, uh, if you wanna follow along with us, you can check us out on Discord. And if you like this kind of content, but you want it to be a little bit more religious in style, or historical in style, if you could get more historical, then you can check us out on Weird Bible, where we pair up with Wendigoon once a month, and we talk about weird Bible things. And then History Hut now has a podcast on it that's happening mm -hmm. once a month as well, where we talk about weird history things, or just history things in general. Uh, but that should generally be it. I think that covers just about everything. Anyway, here's Archie. I'm Aiden Madison. Thanks for stopping by the Lore Lodge.